Schachter. And today I have the pleasure uh, of having with us Professor Elani Oran, who's going to talk about mechanisms and occurrence of detonation in vapor cloud explosions. Professor Elani Oran awarded her bachelor degree in physics and also in chemistry from Brian Moor College. She attended Yale University, where she received her master's from the Department of Physics and her PhD from the Department of Engineering and Applied Science. She's currently a professor at Texas A&M University. She had worked at the Department of Aerospace Engineering at the University of Maryland as a Glenn L. Martin Institute Professor of Engineering from 2013 to 2019. She continues to serve as an emeritus scientist at the U.S. Naval Research Laboratory, and she's adjunct professor at the University of Michigan and a visiting professor at Leeds University. She's also a senior visiting professor at the Institute of Advanced Study at Hong Kong, University of Science and Technology, and distinguished visiting professor at Tsinghua University. I have uh, the pleasure to have with us learn and I would like to thank you again for accepting our invitation and without any further ado I'll hand it to you Eleni. Thank you. Well thank you very much Savio and good morning to everyone. Well I think it's morning for most people listening in. Uh, it's almost afternoon here but I think it's earlier in where you are in Brazil and I want to talk to you today about a topic that is really it, it's amazing because it's, the, it's a topic that drew a lot of credibility from very, very basic research, but it has implications, large-scale implications for safety, energy, and many other things that, that endanger us due to chemical explosions or even nuclear explosions in this country. The topic is mechanisms and occurrence of detonations in vapor cloud explosions. Now the question that we were asked by Shell Research was this, what evidence is there for detonations in vapor cloud explosions? Don't worry, I'm going to define a lot of these terms as we move on. And if so, what circumstances lead to this very violent form of combustion wave? And to do this work, I had the pleasure of dealing with a lot of experts in forensics of explosions, including Jeff Chamberlain, Michael Johnson, Andre Pakalski, Kelly Thomas, and many others, including all of my colleagues that worked in the basic mechanisms of detonation creation. Uh, and what I'll be talking about today really derives from a large review paper that three of us wrote, Jeff, uh, Jeff and Andre and I, called by the same title of this talk, Mechanisms and Occurrence of Detonations in Vapor Cloud Explosions. So let's start from the beginning. It's always easier to start from the beginning and there's less confusion. A vapor, a gaseous state of a liquid or solid. I believe most chemical engineers don't need to hear this. A substance diffused or suspended in the air, especially one normally liquid or solid. Now here, this is a bit of a joke. Vapor in American and vapor in British uh, is a substance in the gas phase at a temperature lower than its critical temperature. And that means that the vapor can be condensed into a liquid by increasing the prep pressure without reducing the temperature must much. <coughs> Excuse me. A vapor cloud is vapor gathered in one place. Now the problem occurs when this fuel vapor extends over a rather extensive area in an environment. It could be flammable. A spark can occur. You, you know, I don't I guess you know about sparks. They just occur and cause a lot of trouble sometimes. And examples of when there were large explosions that resulted from a spark occurring in a vapor cloud are the Bunsfield explosion in 2005. And I'll come back to that one. That's a very basic study. And the UFA explosion in 1998 in the USSR. And there were many others. And this is what the vapor cloud looks like on CCTV 
uh, when it looks at it, uh, when it looked at the vapor uh, and what they saw at Bunchfield. This was vapor that had, uh, and I'll explain how it got there, and it was sitting here low on the ground. Now let's back up. Let's back up and let's talk about uh, detonations and flames from a rather elementary point of view so you, we can understand what the issue was, what the fundamental issue was that had to be addressed. Now, exothermic systems can be characterized by a pressure volume diagram. And this is the, th the theory, the underlying theory. For steady planar 1D flow in a homogeneous material, conservation of mass, momentum, and energy, and you solve this, these equations, gives you a locus of possible final states after the energy is released. For exothermic processes, you, uh, this all means that you wind up with two very different states. A deflagration state, and this is the final lower branch of this curve on the pressure volume diagram. And a detonation, which is the final, which is the upper curve, this round one up here, on the di roundish one on the diagram. Okay. Now, these two states, so you can see the difference here. Let's go back. Sorry. In this one, there's a for a small change in volume, there's a large change in pressure. And this is the opposite situation. Not much change in pressure for a large change in volume. These are steady, this is a steady state analysis. And it gives you the chapman jugay detonation velocity, which is a, this inflection, this point on the curve here, and the chapman jugay flame speed, deflagration speed, which is this point here. Now, the point of this, however, is this is a steady state picture. It gives us absolutely no idea of the dynamics of the system, any intermediate unsteady states that could lead to a transition among these steady states. In fact, this is an un, an, a, a regime here where there would be a connection where it's not allowed physically. But remember, this is a very idealized calculation. Very important one, then. So the question in... In basic question in combustion theory was how do you get from this? How do you get from a flame to a detonation? Do you get to a flame from a detonation? <laughs> and uh, sy systems with very large flames and very small flames were seen to suddenly create detonations. How did this happen? And there were a lot of strange theories that came into play here. Let me just define these a little bit better so we can, so you understand more where I'm coming from. When we talk in combustion, we talk about laminar flames, turbulent flames, and detonations. A laminar flame is a flame that goes at a very low velocity. Oh, the laminar flame speed for, for methane is about 40 centimeters a second for hydrogen in air, 200 centimeters a second. And a laminar flame, this a propagation of a reaction front through a reactive material converting fuel to products, is controlled by the energy release, which results in some expansion uh, due to the chemical reactions, molecular diffusion, thermal, thermal conduction, some radiation effects, and there's a finite width reaction front which propagates through relatively slowly compared to a detonation which goes at Mach 2, 3, 4, even 5, very, very fast flow. And it can happen even in the same material as, it hap as this flame uh, that could support this very slow flame. So you have a very slow flame possible solution, a very fast detonation possible solution. This detonation is at Mach greater than 1, energy release, drives the shocks in the flow, lots of shocks and complex shock structures, moves very quickly, and in seconds, the whole system can be destroyed. And we'll talk about that more. Then there's this crazy intermediate range of turbulent flames, 
uh, any, there's a lot of things that can happen in that regime, and that's an issue, a thing of some study. They're not well understood, uh, turbulent flames, but uh, transitions among these states are even less well understood. So what I will be showing you is some progress here in understanding this transition. Um, this is a movie which, which I'm not going to show you. There are two movies here. Uh, because you can't hear the sound through this through this uh, uh, th this way of pre presentation, and the sound is really important. Uh, but I want to tell you um, the the difference between a deflagration and a detonation. One difference. These were some experiments that were done in the California desert, and this what they did was put a mixture of hydrogen, oxygen, lean, very lean in here hydrogen oxygen stoichiometric here lighted it with a spark and you can and had pressure trans, transducers along the this concrete wall scale here this is a meter high these are steps coming down now the pressures that you got when you when the detonation occurred were very high here you had 100 pascal kilopascals uh, it says here 200 kilopascals. Here it's hardly very much pressure change at all from the deflagration. The sound difference that I wish you could hear is enormous. The detonation sound, you feel it. You're, you know immediately. Once you hear the sound of a detonation, you can tell if a system has detonated or not. Uh, so let's move on here. So the idea here is that deflagrations are bad. Detonations are absolutely terrible. Look at those high pressures. And this transition can be catastrophic sometimes. OK, this was another one I was going to show you. It was a coal mine explosion. I was going to show, play the movie for you and ask you if this, if this mine explosion was, in fact, a detonation. And I'm sorry I can't do that because it you'd know right away. And this was a, a horrible explosion in a coal mine detonation, which killed many people. So this was the abstract that I put together. Not all accidental releases of flammable gases and vapors create explosions. Most releases do not find an ignition source. And of those that do ignite, most of them result in deflagrations that generate low or moderate overpressures. Under some circumstances, however, it is possible for DDT to occur, and this can be followed by a propagating detonation that quickly consumes the remaining cloud. It can re consume it, by the way, in seconds. And just to give you an, an interesting fact in you also have these kinds of transitions in supernova type 1a supernova and in the supernova explosion a detonation consumes the entire star in three seconds two or three seconds also in a detonable cloud a detonation creates the worst accident that can happen and this is because of the huge overpressures that you can get uh, in a in a in a detonation that you don't get in a deflagration. So these are pretty severe events. 2005, there was an explosion in the United Kingdom. December 5th, 2005, and this is a picture of it. It's, it was at Bunsfield in the United Kingdom. I'm going to bring this up be, be, uh, because it was because of this particular uh, explosion that we learn so much about vapor cloud explosions in general. It excited tremendous research uh, for a number of reasons. And uh, you'll see these in, in a minute. And uh, therefore, it is a very important marker in, our being, uh, in the evolution of our understanding what happens in vapor cloud explosions and whether they can detonate. The Bunsfield va vapor cloud explosion Here's just general information. Bunfield was a fuel storage facility in London that had a capacity of about 200 kilotons. Now, in December 2005, early in the morning, 
Um, there was pretty much nobody there. I think there was one person there watching from a distance. It held considerable amount of gasoline and some and some other mixtures of rather low volatility hydrocarbons. Um, there was a little wind, not much wind at all, just a little bit, and so the vapor sort of spread and mixed with the air without much stopping it, and a considerable amount, 300 tons, were released, was released from these storage facilities. And this created about a 400 meter square, roughly, pancake-shaped cloud over the area. And then it had, a little, it had about an hour or so to permeate the system. They spread through the ground, and after 40 minutes, there was a spark in the electrical circuit in a pump house, this ignited the cloud, and this released a huge amount of energy in two seconds. Uh, there were two, two huge explosions, and one of them uh, you could even measure on the Richter scale. And eventually, a whole, most of it burned up. And the pictures are kind of interesting here. This, is, this, is, this shows the uh, burning, burning cloud going across the... Uh, the earth. It's probably a, a plant picture from a plane. This is a satellite view which shows the clouds spreading. It, it could be heard in Europe, I understand. And this shows before, the, before and after damage. The damage was really excessive. So the question we were asking since the Vapor clouds don't explode, that was, don't detonate, that was just the rule. Uh, you don't have to prepare for anything like this. But they, this forced people to ask why would this, was there such extensive damage? Just another case that I thought was really interesting was uh, a, va a huge, even bigger vapor cloud formed in Ufa, Siberia. This was considered 1989. And this huge vapor cloud uh, pipeline burst, uh, the fuel cloud spread. This is where it showed a, a rupture here. And then there was a train track going through. Uh, the trains crossed each other, and they believe a spark was generated. And this triggered a, a, a turbulent fl a flame and a turbulent flame. And then somewhere there was an enormous explosion. And they said the origin of the ignition is most likely inside the trains from an open flame or spark caused by the trains. A small explosion inside a train, a large explosion, a fireball, and a firestorm. And this is one of the most interesting things about UFA. It's a little side thing here, not, not quite related to what we're talking about. Let's go back. In one area, they found that these arrows point to the direction trees, huge fir trees, were downed or fallen. And in this area, they were, for, they were downed in a large vortex going around. Looks like there was an enormous fire tornado in that region. I'll go, skip these pictures here. And here I just listed some other vapor cloud explosions. There was the Bunsfield run. Right around the same time was one in India, in Jaipur, Capeco, Amawe, Brenham is in Texas, so on and so forth. A lot of these are in Texas, which I think is rather interesting. And uh, here we tried to figure out a little bit what was going on, what the fuel was. It's mostly gasolines. Uh, this one was cyclohexane here, butane, ethylene, paraffins. And we tried to figure out what the ignition source was. All right, now, there's a generic picture of an explosion. And I thought I, and this is you, you essentially in the minds of the, of the community. Uh, an explosion here, you start out with some steady state. There's a transitioning state that's formed, some sort of, huge undefined transition occurs and then you wind up with a new state, a stable state or some metastable state. Uh, and very often this explosion will just wipe out everything here. So this is just an evolution of the system and this is a, a state change, kind of a progress variable. It's a very generic picture and we fill it in a little bit. 
so the question for Bunsfield, Jaipur, Rufa is why was there so much damage? Could it have detonated? So what I'm going to do now is give you a brief overview of detonations at DDT, DDT in particular, discussion of laboratory markers for DDT, discussion of what we used as markers for these large vapor cloud explosions, and give you a just a brief overview of, our, of the summary of the analysis that we did and then some conclusions. So here we're going back to basics. And back to basics means how does this detonate? It really starts off a little bit uh, with that steady, starts off with that steady state diagram and that unallowed state that I showed you before. Somehow there has to be a transition. Now, our approach was numerical, and uh, we developed a lot of different numerical codes to study de detonations, deflagrations, and DDT. Many different algorithms, some were invented, some were taken from the, from the shelf that we used to check results. Uh, we had submodels for various kinds of chemical reactions and energy reliefs. Resolution was a very important thing, adaptive gridding. And the most important thing of anything we did to try to figure out how DDT happened was to do a, do a simulation and then we had some kind of experiment that we could test it against. And this is a process which is ongoing. This presentation is not going to be on any of these four topics, which each one alone could be one or two presentations. Development of models, checking models, comparing them to experiments. But I want to give you the bottom line right now. Uh, this is an area in which the, the ability to simulate a system has gone rather far beyond what we have experimental data for. And perhaps if someone asks me at the end, I'll give them the, the bottom line on this. Okay, so back to how does DDT occur? How, does it, how do you get the transition? So this is the canonical problem that people have used to study this. Uh, and um, this, let's see, it says, use this example to illustrate what happens in the regions of the generic explosion diagram. Okay. So let's consider an energetic gas mixture. Could be hydrogen air, could be methane air, could be gasoline air, anything. Um, could be oxygen instead of hydrogen oxygen. Any kind of reactive mixture uh, that could sustain both a laminar flame and a detonation within the detonability limits. And uh, put them in a, in a tube, a channel, and ignite it at one end. Normally there are obstacles in here and, and these have a very, very clear function in most application, mines, engines, fuel storage plant, all contain obstacles. So this is in fact a reasonable configuration to study. So the channel could be all different geometries, uh, rectangular, cylindrical, sizes vary depending on the fuels, optical spacing, shape, all vary. There's been a lot of studies of these experimentally. And we started to, exper uh, to study it computationally at one point. And I'm going to show you now a movie. And there's no sound, so there's no problem. I'll be the only sound. Uh, that of one of these systems, a calculation was done a while ago, and this was probably the calculation that really showed us how it happened. Now, in this movie, uh, it's, it's a hydrogen air system, and what you do is you light a flame, you put a little tiny flame or a little tiny spark, in this case it's just to put a flame down here, and uh, it, let it propagate through the system. And the second part of the system, which should come over here, another is, is shown down here. This square format uh, allows us to show more of what's happening. You'll see that when I show you other movies that don't have that format. 
So the flow, flow that's generated goes out here and then it'll come in here. Now this movie is going to sh show you, and I think it's, it's probably one of the, really changed the way people thought, that starting with a small flame in a channel containing a combustible mixture, a turbulent flame develops, produces shock waves, and this leads to the formation of unsteady shock flame complexes. And finally, you see how D DDT occurs. So let's get that movie up. Fortunately, we've got this movie. Make it as big as we can. Maybe not quite as big as we can. Um, and let's let it go. All right, so you'll, by the way, this is a, you're looking at temperature. This is a, a color bar here, which, which has two sides to it. One, uh, one scale is unburned material. This flame is propagating into unburned material. This is burned material here. Uh, so it's a, there's a double scale. It lets you get more resolution. And we put a series of obstacles in. This was actually a calculation done for um, a construction company that was building hydrogen refueling stations. All right, so let's let it go. So I think I'll try to control it by hand. The first thing that happened is, is the flame sort of sorts itself out. Because of the adaptive gridding, you get quite a bit of resolution in the flame front. But the, it is a subsonic flow in a compressible, using a compressible solution method. So we are getting all of the acoustic fields that are generated. And you can begin to see interactions with the bound, with a boundary here. Um, and uh, the, I guess the top is actually open in this case. The bottom is closed, reflective. And, um, and this is an outflow here into this bottom region. All right, so let's let it go. The flame begin. you can see interactions already of the flame with the obstacle because of the acoustic waves. Eventually, you'll see the shedding that the flow across here generates. This flame expands pretty quickly Time is in the scale on the left. And here it's already moved into the bottom region. Let me get rid of this cut this thing here now. And, go. and it's you'll see it's becoming more and more turbulent as it interacts with the uh, flow that it has generated in the back uh, in the in the unreacted material. It becomes unstable quickly. A lot of instabilities forming, Rick, probably mostly Kelvin Homo, some Rick Meyer Meshkoff. Beginning to see a little bit of shedding over here now. You'll see more of it as we proceed. So we have a turbulent flame, which is accelerating. And what it's, let's move it backwards a little bit. And what it's doing is it's generating shock wave, acoustic waves, which propagate forward. Weak shocks at this point. Here's a weak shock that was generated and reflected from this wall. And here, the, you, this is absolutely lovely when you see how all the acoustic waves generated by the accelerating flame form up into a shock. The unreacted flow ahead of the turbulent flame contains a lot of shock waves. It's a very turbulent, shocked medium. It's, it's actually what I would call non-equilibrium turbulence because it's being driven by all scales are being driven by shock waves that, uh, throughout, the, throughout the time it exists. Here you can see the shock waves, uh, the acoustic waves building up to a shock, shedding over the step. The mock stem and the incident shock here are getting stronger and stronger so that as they reflect from the wall, you actually get some reactions to start with. The reflections of the shock back into the flame uh, give you rickmeyer meshkoff instabilities, which take a little while to form. Um, they have a time scale associated with them. And here it's getting stronger and stronger. Watch the reflections. Here, this is a reflection which generated a flame and a shock. The uh, shock goes back through the flame. More rickmeyer meshkoff But at some point, that reflection, you feel very clearly a flame here. And that reflection is strong enough. Let's go back. Let's catch this. 
a detonation develops, it goes up over the obstacle and propagates to the system. And this takes over the system. This is actually an unsteady detonation, a galloping detonation, because the system size isn't quite large enough to support uh, a full one. And um, so, but it, nonetheless, it's strong, it continues, and it will eat up everything in the system until there's nothing left. All right. Now, this calculation had so much in it, it was amazing. It taught us a lot. Let's, let's go through here. The initially laminar flame moves slowly through the unreacting material. Obstacles perturb the flow. The flow interacts and distorts the flame. The flame accelerates and becomes turbulent. That's what you saw. The turbulent flame generates these compression waves, uh, which coalesce to form shocks in front of the flame. The shock is continuously strengthened by the uh, compression waves coming from behind. The shocks reflect from obstacles, create these hot spots or these ignition centers, and these ignition centers become the spontaneous waves that form the detonation. And if you take those results and you put them on what looks like an explosion diagram, you can see here, this is, uh, this is similar to that diagram, ideal diagram we showed you I showed you before. This is the region of flame acceleration and formation of a turbulent flame. This is the transition region, and this is the final region where this detonation is formed. Uh, these movies have incredible detail in them, and you can learn an awful lot about reactive fluid dynamics and just an unreactive fluid dynamics by studying. And you see all of these flame instabilities, but now we need to take a little more global approach. But before we do that, I did want to make one point. The detonations appear from these hot spots that form an unreacted material. And Study has shown, and I haven't gone into that here, that these start as gradient, these little hot spots are gradients of reactivity, and the mechanism by which they undergo the transition to a detonation uh, is the Zeldovich mechanism of transition in a gradient, which is very similar to the Swayzer mechanism. The same idea. In order to get the transition, you need to have a gradient uh, in, of reactivity. So how do you create a detonation? Well, there's direct initiation, deflagration to detonation transition, and something in between. What is direct in, uh, initiation? You create a strong shock in a reactive material, like an explode, like take one of these channels full of, react, uh, of say, natural gas, and a pipe of natural gas and, uh, and air, uh, in it mixed with air, uh, put a lot of, in, put, put, put a detonable material, a, de a high explosive at one end of it, for example, you're just creating a very strong shock. You don't really know what's happening, but if you look at the very end, um, you see that, well, it was a detonation. And I'll tell you in a minute how to tell that. Uh, this is a situation where you light it, you run away and you look at what happens afterwards. <laughs> then there's the DDT, the deflagration detonation transition. And this is a situation where the deflagration itself creates the conditions in which the detonation can arise. And this idea introduced the, this introduced the idea of a hot spot or gradient reactivity, which can evolve into a detonation. Uh, the evolution, however, requires creating a shock. Shocks are really important in this study. And then there's something in between, and I'll show you some of them. There's, there's what we call shock focusing, which is like a direct initiation. It's somewhere in between these, these one and two here. And there, there are other means of generating a shock, such as strong turbulence. The whole idea always is you need to have that initial, even small shock. Um, here, I, I talked about something in between. I'm going to show you another movie. Uh, this was a calculation that was done by one of my graduate students, uh, Gabriel Goodwin. 
the bottom is a Schlieren, the top is, uh, is I believe, temperature. So you get to see the whole thing at once, um, temp temperature and this gradient of reactivity. So let's just watch it go, and I'll speed it up at some point. Uh, I think this is ethylene oxygen, and it was to model an experiment that was done. And uh, the flame starts out very slowly. It's just, again, we started not with a spark, but really with an initial flame. And I'm going to make it go much faster now so we can get to the point. Again, it's the same kind of physics. Let's stop it here. It's turbulent, becomes turbulent. There's a lot of sh more turbulence at smaller scales formed from shedding from these obstacles here. Much easier to see these things in the Schlieren than in the temperature, but the temperature tells us a lot. Let's speed it up again, too. Um, there's a lot happening here. The flame is coming unstable. A lot, a lot of acoustic waves and shocks formed in the background, unreacted material. And here, I think I'll just let, I'm going to drive this thing by hand. Now, I think that doesn't go fast enough. Let it go faster. There we go. And you see the system evolving. It just gets worse and worse, to be honest. Let's let it go faster. All right, now. At some point, the shocks are going to get strong enough. They're going to all focus in one spot, and there'll be like a small explosion there. Let's let it go. All right, stop it. And there's where it happened. Go back, take a look. This region here, this little region near the boundary, there were a number of shocks focusing in it. In the, it was an unreacted material, possibly even beginning to react. Here you can see that the uh, back a little more. Stop, it started near the boundary where a lot of shocks reflected. And then once this happened, you can't stop it. It'll finish up the compressed material and go into the compressed heated material and propagate into the colder unreacted material from there. So you started it off in hot material that had been shocked, then it propagates. Okay, so let's get out of here now. And so I think I've convinced you that, whoops, where is it? Uh, very careful look at this. I'm not going to go into that here. There's a huge amount of analysis of the shocking interactions. Interesting thing about detonation and detonation propagation. A little side thing, perhaps not totally relevant to this presentation, is that we do a calculation in 2D. We do the analogous calculation in 3D. The location, the time of DDT changes. The complexity does not change. It's more or less the same. Sorry. We see that, um, and, and this is a way we actually would determine that really what was going on here was the shock focusing mechanism. It wasn't an artifact of doing 2D. Um, okay. Another way to ignite a detonation. You think it's a different way. It's maybe a different way of just getting to a shock. And that's to take a channel. And this is a periodic condition where you have turbulent background flow and a flame propagating in the turbulent background flow. And let's see if I can blow this up and show it to you, this movie here. Now, this is going to show you something kind of sneaky, but we're looking at is, a, is a, let me see, fuel mass, a fuel mass fraction. Uh, unreacted, reacted. It's a flame propagating into a background turbulent flow. Now, what you want to watch here is it becomes very, very turbulent. And turbulence increases. And I slowed the movie down so you can see it. But something very interesting happens as the turbulence interacts with, with the flame. And it becomes more and more compacted it, as it winds the flame around. And eventually, because it is compressible, little shock will form. 
and it will transition to a detonation. And this is a 3D propagating detonation. Let's get out of here. Okay. Now, what happened in here? Now, remember, this started off with just a flame and just turbulence. Is that the turbulence became so intense that uh, the compressible turbulence generates small shocks. We had sh some shocks forming, which helped cause more shocks. And if you look at, try to look at what happened in here, which is very hard, you see a series of shock forms formed, and this is what caused the hot spots that gave us our detonation. So we know, whoops, let's get out of here. We know now how, to, how this is happening. And we know that the scales for this to happen are very small. So the things that show us in the laboratory that we have, in fact, a detonation are really two main things. One is a propagating wave that's going at this Chapman Jugay velocity. And the other thing is something I haven't discussed, but it's something I do very fundamental to the nature of gas phase detonations called detonation cell structure. Remember I showed you that propagating detonation with all, had all these streaks behind it. I didn't point it out. But these are actually transverse shock waves, and they form very pretty patterns and designs when you look at either open shutter in or soot foil traces. So those are true markers that you have detonations, the velocity, not just the velocity, but if you have those cells. And I'm sorry, I don't think you, I'm going to, you can see it all that well, but here are cells in natural gas and air. And they're about, oh, about 17 centimeters across like that. And these were ones that we measured in a large detonation tube that we were using for experiments for NIOSH. Okay, now let's get back to the big question that we were asked. Could we have a detonation in a vapor cloud explosion? We had to because there was such extension, extensive damage. So as, a, answering this question led to extensive large and small scale stud tests to determine if, when, and how DDT occurred. The important thing is we're starting this out knowing that DDT, that this transition could occur uh, in a confined situation because of shock focusing and even in an unconfined situation, if the turbulence intensity is high enough, okay? But the key, key in all situations was form this little shock in the reactive material. It'll, it'll heat things up. It'll form more shock. More shocks will form in some way. Okay, so let's change our minds completely. Let's look at detonation markers in, in vapor cloud explosions. Sounds very different. How did, what are our detonation markers that we're going to use to determine if there was DDT? Oh, very often we could trace the, we could walk a, a, a length of a, a length and see where a, 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 a turbulent flame had been propagating down a tube, and we could actually see this hop, where this had happened, and we could postulate while well, a shock came out and reflected, and then there was DDT. But that was, those were kind of guesses. We, were had, we had to sort of do this forensic study after the fact. And so we look at damage to property, damage to cars, damage to steel drums that were in the way, instrument boxes, containers, storage tanks. People looked at something called directional indicators, which may be a little bit which th this is a point of argument whether these were really correct or not. Richter scale measurements. How intense was the explosion? Broken gas, pressures exiting the region. Because of Bunsfield, whole car, whole situation was developed where cars were taken and subjected to detonations in the region of the car, outside the region of the car, different distances from the car, to see the level of damage that it would cause. And could we correlate that with what we saw at Bunsfield, Jaipur, and so forth? Uh, the directional indicators were curious. I think in some cases you could actually tell that where the detonation happened from a number of the of way tree 
Trees and poles had fallen or were damaged. This was the analysis for Bunsfield. Let's skip these oil drums, different, they were subjected. The final test, which gave it away for Bunsfield, uh, and related it back to all of these fundamental studies that we had done was the postulate that, or the observation that the DDT occurred as the flame, turbulent flame was moving down a street lined with trees, okay? At Spade Adam, which is a large test area in England, they did these incredible experiments where they did put a line of vegetation, uh, very large. I mean, this is, you can see there's a person here, this would be like 70 or 100 meters, ignited uh, in, a, in a plastic container and then lighted it at one end. Oh, and filled it with, it filled it with the different kinds of brush. Uh, one kind of brush was the hardwood that they had at Bunsfield. And the other was a softwood tree, hardwood like the, where they saw the uh, definitely the transition. They thought the transition might have occurred, and lo and behold, and this is this is unfortunate uh, that you can't hear this, but maybe I can show it to you. Um, lo and behold, when when they used the right kind of foliage. I'm sorry, you, you can't if you can't hear that. That's really quite amazing. When they used the, the same kind of foliage, there was a detonation. When they used a softer wood, there was not. And this leads us back to the turbulence theory of turbulence enhance, enhancing uh, the, the, the trees acting as a grate, which enhance the turbulence, and then there's a flame and created shocks, and then there's a small interaction, maybe a tiny little place where DDT occurred. Okay, anyhow, let's keep going on here. So when we were looking at these industrial explosions, we had a number of markers. We said vehicle damage, tires debated, crushed oil drums, Richter scale greater than two, windows broken. This is going from the very theoretical, in fact, and very computational basic to very applied. And trying to figure out if we could, how many of these explosions that we had data on fit these various criteria. And we went through many accidents that had happened, too many of them in Texas, I'm afraid. Um, looked at these detonation markers that I showed you and, try, and looked at the kind of fuel, all kinds of information gathered. And, and we could, and quite a few of them came out with, yes, there was definitely a, de uh, a detonation there. Some of them were more obvious than others. Some were ambiguous, but there was no question that in fact a vapor cloud could explosion, a vapor cloud explosion in some large fuel storage area or around it could undergo a detonation. So here's, here are some observations and suggestions which came out of the problem. Existing standards do not consider the possibility of detonation for safety in these plants. There's all, we can, we have to think of ways that can limit the uh, limit the cloud, the spread of the cloud, uh, and limit these heavier-than-air pancake-shaped clouds. Um, sensors would be important, active suppression, um, careful placement with respect to vegetation. Uh, clearly, it is running down this row of trees, uh, which again, they could have just had put a big grate on. You know what grate does when when a flow goes through it, it makes it turbulent. And these trees acted as a great, plus added a little fuel too from the leaves. Someone made the comment, well, gee, in our power plants, we don't have vege any vegetation around. Um, CCTV was important. Uh, separation of, space, of congested spaces, congestion leads to 
this possible transition. And um, the most important thing that happened in Buntsfield is that when it happened, they got the investigators in very fast. They could go through and look at what happened, and we could try to understand it. So we also, that's one thing. That's the basic vapor cloud problem. I think we have a better idea now of what's going on. The fact that it can detonate is scary. Uh, it doesn't do it very often, but when it does, you know, you could see two seconds, the whole thing gets wiped out. Fundamental mechanism detonation initiation, that helped to show us that, in fact, it could happen and gave us some intuition and guidance as to why. We need to know a little bit more about detonation limits for hydrocarbons and mixtures. A curious fact about, about detonation limits is that they, they get wider and wider as the system gets larger and larger. That is a very interesting point. It leads to many questions and possible scenarios. We need to know about quenching detonations, both active and passive. Active suppression, various ways of, of using water spray or chemicals. And there's this fundamental issue here is, can we predict DDT for large systems? That's a hard question. Well, that's the end of my talk. And we've looked at fundamental mechanisms of DDT. And we've learned that they can be, we can learn a lot from controlled experiments and simulations. And we're doing a lot of those now. The particular large-scale background conditions that might evolve into DDT vary greatly. The fundamental mechanisms all involve something small and with shocks. Too small, in fact, to be resolved in a, in, in a, in a full calculation of a very large system. But they can tell us what's, what happened, give us an idea. Knowing the conditions that enable DDT and understanding how it works provides information that we can use for design of these power plants. And we have these fuel storage plants, and we've given a number of those in the report. And with that, I'd like to thank you and, um, for the, and, and thank you for your patience for this rather wandering study that was a little bit all over the map from very small to very big uh, and to not very dangerous little flames to enormously dangerous detonations. And this is a, I guess this is a picture from Texas. I'm not sure, but I suppose it could be to be from Brazil too. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Elaine. Thanks a lot for putting together such lovely, uh, seminar and presentation. I do have a few questions here from, from the audience on the YouTube and some that I have uh, on paper as well. So I'll start with the first one. Uh, in the beginning of, of the presentation, you mentioned nuclear explosions. Are they somehow different in terms of behavior of the explosion and detonation? Ah, I gave a talk on that uh, two days ago. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, actually, the situation that started all of our studies in DDT, not in, in actually the structure of propagating detonations, but in DDT, was a call from an astrophysicist who asked me, how, does de how do detonations occur in supernova explosions. Now, a supernova explosion, the kind he was interested in, was called a Type 1a, which is a, a, a star about the size of Earth, called a white dwarf, where the helium and hydrogen have burned out, and you're left with, with carbon and oxygen in a sea of electrons. Um, it's, it is a detonable mixture. After, a, after this white dead white dwarf sits there for a couple billion years, it explodes. And right now, there's been a lot of studies of these type 1a supernovas. Uh, but the point is, what happened in the supernova, and we know this now, 
Originally, the idea was, was it a deflagration or was it a detonation? Then a colleague of mine who knew some combustion said, don't be ridiculous, it's a DDT. It starts out as a deflagration. It transitions somehow, becomes a detonation. The entire star is wiped out in two seconds. Just like Bunsfield, only 10 to the 51 ergs of energy is released into the universe. And these are very important stars uh, be, for a number of reasons. One is that, um, besides the fact that they're just fundamental combustion laboratories for us to play with in some sense from a computational and theoretical point of view, these stars are so similar in their explosions all throughout the universe that you can use them to measure properties of the universe. And that's why in some years ago, people got a Nobel Prize for these supernova studies, gathering all the information from these DDT events and trying to find out whether the universe was open or closed, how fast it was expanding. So it turned out that the, the whole processes that go on, the flames, the transition, going here in the supernovas, it was going on as carbon oxygen reactions, which is a little more complex flame, um, very energetic series of processes. Uh, and it was just, they're just so similar all throughout the universe. And now people are observing very many of these things. So the statistics are getting better and better. But the combustion processes we look at are so similar. I mean, um, the, me the chemical mechanism is a nuclear mechanism. Um, actually, I think they know that better than we know the hydrocarbon mechanisms. <laughs> and and, and there's a, it's, yes, it, it's the same physics. So in some sense, it's the same set of compressible, multidimensional Navier-Stokes equations. So we started out looking at the star. And then to study the star, we say we can't study the star back in 1990 or 2000. So we started to look at the work that had been done in combustion in channels. And that's what really told us what was happening. And then it's this small scale work that we could then go back and understand what, that it could happen on a large scale. DDT could have happened in the trees because of the trees in Bud's field because of turbulence flame interactions generating enough shocks. So the two fields, it's amazing in this case how the astrophysics of the supernova work and other kinds of supernova too, tied in with all the terrestrial work and they fed on each other. Yeah. We still don't know how the supernova explodes, but I can tell you how it's going to happen in your pipe. <laughs> uh, uh, well, well, another question that I have here is asked, what are the limitations of the large-scale experiment involving explosions? If they happen outside, what are the best climate conditions to assure that we can reproduce the data? I know that there have been some experiments on vapor cloud explosions. Uh, the, the ones, I don't know of that many myself. I have not been involved in them. I've been more involved in determining whether the trees would cause it. And that's, ex and that particular, and looking at the pieces of the problem. For example, what does it do to an automobile if, if it's in if it's in um, if it's in a detonation here here or you know this regime or what happens when you put a deflagration through trees or what happens when it travels down an underground a, a, an accelerating flame travels down an underground pipe this is looking at the mechanisms that's much more fruitful in some ways are telling us why and how things could happen than in actually creating one outside with a lot of unknown conditions. 
uh, we do. So I, I don't know quite how to answer that question. Uh, is the person want, want to know how he can make a vapor cloud explosion and ignite it? Or does he want to know what might have ignited one that existed? So I think this is a good question that needs a little more discussion. Yeah, definitely. Uh, there's, there's one thing that I'm, I'm thinking here myself. As you increase the turbulence for a particular reacting flow, you accelerate the flame up to a maximum value and it might have extinguished. So I'm talking about the bending effect. Yeah, but yeah, in, that, but, yeah. Yeah, but, but in terms of, of detonation, it turns out that the turbulence plays a very potent role and you'll never extinguish the flame. Actually, you have exactly the opposite. You favor the propagation and the speed up of the flame. So how these two things are related? I'm not sure. Okay. Mm. Uh, I, uh, I, I don't know. And I think it might have to do with the size of the vessel in which the experiment where the bending occur existed. Uh, I, it may have to do with the material or the intensity of the waves. I've seen this bending, but I haven't studied it. And I believe that some people have been able to reproduce it in simulations. I'm not sure that their turbulence has gotten nearly as intense as the kind that can de has to develop in order to create the situation where DDT occurs. Now, it's possible it's a competing effect. And if the, if the, DD, if the situation is such, for example, it's, it's a stoichiometric mixture or something like that, and enough shocks form to create DDT before any bending or reduction can happen, it'll blow itself up before it extinguishes. Mm -hmm. I, I hadn't thought of that before, but that's probably something worth looking at. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's another question here. It says, the, the mechanisms of detonation and explosion seem to be extremely complex for people who are not in the field, such as myself. So that's the case of someone who's asking the question. And then he asked us, or, or she, what are the knowledge gaps regarding, regarding explosions? What are the biggest challenges research uh, should face? Well, there's, there's two things. One is the basic questions. And one is the more global things like, will my power plant explode? I can address the first one for sure. Uh, the second one, it'll take all sorts of civil and explosion engineers to tell you. And that will have to do with spacing of obstacles and, and fire suppression and detonations, arresters, and that kind of thing. That's another area. Base, there are some very fundamental basic questions which have come up in, uh, in DDT. And I'm hoping to be able to address some of those, either experimentally or computationally. One, there's, you know, there's this really curious thing, and I just love this one. Um, and I mentioned it before. As the system gets larger and larger, the detonation limits, that is how lean or how rich you can get and still get a detonation, get broader and broader till they're almost close to the flammability limits. So my fascinating question is, can you get a detonation beyond the flammability limits? And um, I can argue it either way, okay? From basic principles, I don't know the answer. But just suppose you can really stretch those limits, okay? And um, right now, the, the large tests that we did were uh, we're pushing it very closely. They were in one meter channels, 100 meters long. And they were pushing the flammability limits. And I can tell you physically why that happens. Why that, and it has to do with the basic structure of the propagating detonation and the fact that you can have bigger and bigger detonation cells in larger and larger systems and 
gas phases must have these detonation cells to propagate, or they will die. We're something like those cells, these transverse wave structures. Uh, so I, I wanted to know if you could push it to beyond the flammability limits. I think that's, I've asked a number of theoreticians that, and they don't know the answer. And some of the best have told me, oh, I'm not sure. <laughs> and again, I can told you I can argue that either way. But uh, so then you get, a, get to this rather amusing question of suppose you had uh, methane in the atmosphere for a half a mile up. How much would you need in order to get a detonation? <laughs> No, and that's half a joke and half not a joke. So I, I, that's a very fundamental question. Here's another fundamental question. The region behind the detonation wave, the pressure and temperatures are very high. Uh, they're so high that most of the reactions are not equilibrium. They're not, they're not, they're normal chemical. The chemical mechanisms that we have do not work. They're wrong because they don't, we don't even know some of the non-equilibrium states that are forming. You can have non-equilibrium species, you know, um, excited states of, mo of atoms of, and molecules which will interact, which will form intermediate states. All kinds of different chemistry, this is chemistry, can go on. Uh, right now, there are no, really no chemical mechanisms that can really do that. Um, we, had to, we had to fudge around that to do the calculations. We had to build in knowledge of detonation cells and things like that to get a model that would work so we could do the computations. Um, what is the chemistry? Can we, get, can we spread these reaction zones out far enough, get in there with a laser and try to figure out laser diagnostics, try to figure out what we've got. That's another one we're hoping to try and do here in Texas some point. And there's a lot of basic stuff like that. The, um, the stru uh, structures at the front, how to put it out, how to pr keep it going. We're interested in keeping these detonations going or getting them started very quickly for detonation engines. They're not only bad, but DDT is also something we want to control for high-speed engines. So there are a lot of really fundamental questions, and again, they're at the kind of the limits uh, mm. of what we know. And I, I'm just I'm just rather impressed we've gotten as far as we've had in this topic. Yeah. Uh, well, let me ask you another question. When we, you were saying about the temperature and pressure that we have the very high pressure temperature that you have in the back of the of the detonation front if i may say why you were explaining i was thinking myself from the standard model in the very beginning of the universe the big bang where we have such high temperatures that at the end of the day we don't even have any chemical species but only uh, particles maybe not even particles but electrons if you wish and things like that so is there possible that we have a level of temperature that rather than not only have the non-equilibrium species in the back but also go to some sort of uh elementary particles or something like that did you think that would be possible and that's the reason why yeah, it's so it's complicated to understand what's going on in Yes, yes, I do. I mean, there's two, an two, two answers to your question. First of all, the front of the detonation consists of these intersecting shock waves. And, and they, you get three shock waves intersecting at a point called a triple point. Nobody really knows what the temperatures and pressures at the triple point are. Okay. There's been some attempts to measure them, but all we know is they're very high. What do we do numerically when there's a problem? We just integrate through it. And we get conservation gives us the results. Yeah. Uh, could you use these kinds of shock interactions to create very, to tear the material apart? The answer is probably yes, because I think that's what happens in some of the very, very powerful explosions. The material is torn apart. 
um, and you there's no predict you can't compute this. You just have to look afterwards and see what happened. Um, it's highly non-equilibrium ions, ionized states. You know a lot of electrons at the front of the detonation, as you can, which creates the light you see when you look at these um, Schlieren. Uh, not Schlieren, but these open shutter camera pictures of detonations, you see these structures, and that's formed by light for, emitted from the ionization of the triple point. Back to the beginning of the universe, um, there, I remember reading some studies where people used detonation models for the beginning, uh, for early stages of the universe that caused transitions between one type of particle and another. But it was a detonation model in the same sense you might say that we use a detonation model for the star that I told you about. The inputs are different, the time scales may be different, but again, it's a reactive wave that causes a transition at, at, uh, very quickly in a material. And um, so there, I never pursued that, that study that was done I, I don't I don't know if it has been pursued or not because it involved masses of, of, uh, of, of very elementary particles uh, that uh, and we didn't at that point know the equation of state for this or anything mm. so but maybe somebody knows that now yeah uh, yeah maybe someday I'll check the literature, check my old friends and see what they're doing. Yeah, maybe. But yes, yeah. it, tears, it tears the material apart. Um, it, yeah, well, it, time it, scales we can't resolve. Yeah, yeah. Also, not, not, only, not, not only the length, but the time scales as well, they are very tiny, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. There's another interesting point you mentioned on equilibrium. We're talking about chemistry. There's there's this non-equilibrium turbulence issue also. The leading shock front in the, you know, before the detonation forms, you have this turbulent wave, and then you have a shock front, leading shock. This region between the turbulent flame and the shock front is a, um, is a very turbulent region containing all kinds of shocks. Now, these shocks are generating vorticity, not just at some one large scale that propagates down to make a Kolmogar spectrum, but it, they're generating it all scales simultaneously because of things like these rickmeyer meshkov instabilities. It's a highly non-equilibrium, flat kind of turbulence. And um, almost 2D-ish in the way it looks. And uh, it's a very important part of the process. Oh, yeah. So there's yeah. non-equilibrium fluid dynamic, uh, I wouldn't say fluid dynamic, turbulence, non-equilibrium chemistry behind these. But you move the whole thing back down to 50 or 60 tour, and it becomes rather equilibrium and most of the reactions and, and, and straight models work fine. Yeah. But it's when we get up to the higher, pro you know, room atmospheric conditions where it gets really interesting. Yeah, there's there's one thing, one last thing that I would like to to address here, and something that some sometimes I found myself thinking of. I started to work with this long time ago, more more on the risk analysis side. Then when I went to my PhD, that's when I went down in the fundamentals of combustion and things like that, which turns out to be very it might might be very dangerous, as we've seen in your presentation. But there's another side of the coin, if you wish, which is uh, the supernova and things like that, which in the end of the day we're talking about explosion. They are the main reasons why we are here having this discussion. Because all the things that we know, all the materials, all the chemical elements, they have a place where they were born, and this place are the stars. We are just the stars, and we are very lucky that we are a bunch of molecules and chemical elements that, that somehow were assembled together and they have something which is life and we are having this conversation and, and we are very lucky because if, if um, when we look at the universe 
life is something very unusual. So uh, it's a very hostile environment, which we know very little about. It's, it's so large beyond any comprehension at the time. And I think we, and again, we are very lucky. And I'll, with that, I would like to hear a little bit uh, from you if, you, if you want to share a little bit of your thoughts on that, because at the same time that it's so dangerous and so destructive, it's the reason why we are here. It's the, it's the reason for life itself and all the things which are so wonderful, at least in this planet. And as far as we know, it's the only one we know at the moment that can uh, that they have the proper conditions for life and we should look after we've been through a very rough part haven't we with this all the pandemic things and i think lots of us thought a lot about it and some of the top guys in brazil and in us as well i'm talking about some stupid politicians if you wish they they just ignore the size and at the end of the day, that's what we need to stick on to, to have here, again, having this conversation. So I would like you to share a little bit of your thoughts on that. Well, let me start back in a sentence I didn't finish before. And there, were, as far as the supernova is concerned, there were three major th reasons I thought it's so important. One is it's a combustion laboratory. Two is it gives us information for cosmology, for expansion of the universe. The second one, really, not, is that it gives us all the elements of, of life, and not only life, but of metals and wood and everything around us. It's given us the elements that we need. So when you look around you, everything you see is a remnant of a supernova. It's traveled a long, long way, but that is a scary idea. And it, I think it's true. <laughs> and the other thing that I think about, and I don't like to think about your politicians too much because there's a few feel so futile in that situation. But, and this is something that we wrote once, and I don't know whether I wrote it or one of my colleagues wrote it. I, you know, sometimes you can't remember these things, but you talk about explosions, and they're not only destructive events, but they're creative events. They wipe everything out so that you can start over. That's right. And they're very important. And that's what supernovas are. They stars, they give you material to start over. They give us material that we, that are part of our, they give us our lives. Um, it's, it's a very deep question. And I, yeah, I should spend a lot of time thinking about that question. <laughs> but the th you all, they are creative events. And where we don't want DDT, in our fuel storage plants, we want it in these engines so we can go study more of the universe. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. You know, pros and cons and everything. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know. This is a, it's a wonderful topic. It, it is indeed. Indeed. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't think we have, uh, actually we have more questions here, but we are running late. Probably mm -hmm. I can email them later on. Uh, and again, I would like to thank you very much for accepting our invitation, for sharing with us your time and also your knowledge and your passion. We can see, I remember when we met back in 2019 in the Mary Kay, and I was attending one of your seminars. Uh, uh, everyone can tell how passionate you are about the subject and how easily you, you transfer the knowledge not on, on terms of the physics, but also in the numerical methods, uh, high order schemes and things like that, that I've, I've, I've watched you discussing before. So thank you again. Thank you for, for being with us. It was really a pleasure. Uh, thank you. Well, thank you very much. And someday I hope to actually go to Brazil and not just talk to Brazil. <laughs> yeah, you are very welcome. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.